Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath. Thank you for the sunshine outside, the reminders that there is new life in spring. Thank you for the flowers up here that uh, remind us of your love, Lord. And for the beautiful music we've heard so far in this service, Lord, we thank you for our youth, our children, and the way that they uh, have praised your name. Lord, now I pray that as we consider this message, that you would speak to our hearts and help us, Lord, to be faithful to the calling that you've given to each one of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The changing of the guard. You probably remember where you were yesterday morning when you heard the news. How many of you remember where you were yesterday morning? Yeah. It's probably one of those moments that you won't forget. Uh, one of those moments in your life where you hear something and you always will remember who told you and when it happened. The queen was a much beloved monarch, leader, and as has been shared already today, grandmother and great-grandmother for so many around the world. Whether here in Australia as a part of the Commonwealth or back in my home country of the United States, where we're not a part of the Commonwealth, but we still love and admire the queen. Yesterday was a sad day, but it was also a day of gratefulness for her life, which was so dedicated to her people. Now, an interesting, just a little personal note for me, my grandmother, uh, who uh, loved the queen, actually, I remember her talking about the queen when I was little, and she liked to follow the British royal family. She was the same age as the queen, and she would say, when everybody, anyone asked, how old are you? She would say, just go talk to the queen. <laughs> <laughs> So my Grammy would have been uh, 96 this year. She actually died two years ago. Um, but it was a little personal connection I thought of whenever I thought of the queen. But she was an amazing woman for 70 years. 70 years. She led her nation and the commonwealth with grace, dignity, and courage. The world lost not only a great leader yesterday, but as I heard her described so many times on the news, a beloved grandmother as well. Her life and reign saw immense change over the decades. But though the world changed around her, she remained unchanged in her commitment to her duty and the task of leading her nation and the Commonwealth. In the words of Australian Prime Minister Albanese that were given yesterday, he said these, about, these words about the Queen. It is a time of mourning for the people in Britain, across the Commonwealth, and indeed around the world. There is comfort to be found in Her Majesty's own words. And I don't know if you've seen these words that she wrote, but she said, love is the price we pay for grief. Profound words from Queen Elizabeth. This is a loss, Albanese said, that we deeply feel here in Australia. Now, I don't want to, just because of time, there are so many things that I could mention about her life that you've probably heard from different things or news stories you've seen in the last 24 hours, but I will just mention a few. One of the things that she was known for is that she was a hard worker who was faithful to her task of being queen. How many of you knew that about Queen Elizabeth? Now, I, I heard something interesting yesterday. I, I, didn't, I don't know much, of, I mean, I know a few things, but not much about the monarchy, but they said that every day she received what was called the red box. Have any of you heard of this? The red box. A red, Dennis raised his hand, all right. <laughs> a red leather box. And in this box were important papers from government ministers in the United Kingdom and her realms, I'm also assuming Australia, around the world. And every day she would have to go through this box, stacks of papers, sign her name, fill out things, become familiar with what's happening. And do you know that her entire life, she did this faithfully every night, and she would have it on the desk of her minister the next day by 8 a.m. Now, she was 96 years old, friends, and she was still doing this. Just this past week, on Tuesday, she appointed the new prime minister of Great Britain. That was the last picture that you've seen there. Maybe she saw her standing. She looks kind of frail, but she was smiling, doing her duty. She was faithful to her task. 
She also traveled more than any head of state in history, visiting every country in the Commonwealth and many more countries. Do you know how many trips she took since 1952, official state trips? 290. I thought that working for AWR was a lot of traveling. <laughs> the queen has me beat. <laughs> she traveled a lot. Do you know how many times she came to Australia? 16 times. Amen. All right. You guys, you guys are good Commonwealth members. Amen. <laughs> she loved Australia. I, 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 lis I listened to a few statements she made about Australia yesterday on the news. She was also a dedicated mother and wife, grandmother, and yes, great-grandmother as well. But she was faithful her, to her duty, and there was a statement that has been quoted, you've seen it probably in the last 24 hours, a statement that she made when she was just 21 years old in 1947, and this is what she said. She said, I declare before you that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. I love the way she just says it, her whole life, she declares her whole life will be devoted to her people. This kind of devotion is rarely seen today, but it's a kind of devotion I believe that God is calling us to have as followers of Christ. Now, the passing of the queen, and by the way, she was a faithful Christian. I also read something this morning, actually, that she was a good friend of the Reverend Billy Graham, and Billy Graham said that the queen loved her Bible and loved talking to him about the Bible. Isn't that interesting? Now, as we think about the end of an era, because I know for all of you, this is the end of an era. She's even on your money. That's not something we have in the United States, right? But this is your, this is your queen, right? And now she is gone. For all, this is the only queen most of you have ever known. And today, it's different. Today, there's a king on the throne, not the queen. It reminds us that the life that we live as we know it does not last forever right? This world, the only constant some people say in this world is change. Ultimately, the seasons come and the seasons go. Here we are in spring, right? A reminder that the world continues. The seasons change. There is only one kingdom. There is only one king that will ultimately last forever. Amen. That is King Jesus. Amen. There is only one kingdom to which ultimately you and I are citizens of, and that is the, the kingdom of heaven. And by the way, it doesn't matter whether you're from Australia or the United States of America. We're all citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Amen? That's the kingdom that ultimately matters. But this morning, as we reflect on the queen's life and on her life of service and on this concept of the changing of seasons, I think we can find some lessons for our life today, which will help us live as we look for the soon coming of the king of kings. Now, you know, in thinking about the royal household, I was talking with uh, Marlita, and she reminded me of this particular uh, tradition in the royal household, which if you've been to Buckingham Palace, you might have seen what's called the changing of the guard. Have any of you seen that in London? Amen. A few hands. I've had the privilege of standing there at the fence and watching this elaborate ceremony as these red-coated guards with their big bearskin hats Oh, I missed that. There they are. Change the guard in a very timely and professional way. Now, these guards are amazing. They come from all the Commonwealth nations. They participate in this ceremony, and their sole duty is to protect the queen. It's an ancient organization of the most trained troops, dependable, loyal, and well-trained soldiers. Elizabeth II was there focus since 1952, but their history goes back to 1660. So they stand there for long periods of time. They stand there and they will not be deterred. They can't eat or sleep or drink or even slouch <laughs> or sit or lie down during their duty. They have to stand their guard. Now, if you've ever seen it, tourists will sometimes come and try to dissuade them from their task. They'll try to make them smile. Girls will come up and maybe even kiss them on the cheek, but they cannot smile. If they smile, do you know what happens? Anybody know what happens? I found this fascinating. They actually go to jail. Yeah, 
This is serious. They are truly taking their work seriously. And so they're on for two hours and they're off for four hours. But during those two hours, they go back and forth from their stations. And even if a tourist tries to trip them or get in their way, you know what they say to them, friends? They look and they say, make way for the Queen's Guard. And they keep going because they have a task to do. They are tasked to guard the queen. Or they say, stand back from the queen's guard. Now, if the tourist is really, really uh, persistent and not very nice, they actually will even point the rifle at them. <laughs> of course, you know, just as, a, just as a trying to get them away. But these guards are very, very committed to their task. Now, in thinking about this situation that we're in today and in thinking about these guards that are faithful to their duty I was thinking what Bible story was there is there a, a story from the word of God that illustrates this concept of faithfulness to duty is there a story is there a particular passage that we could look at today you might be thinking of some in your minds and maybe some of you are thinking of what I thought of yesterday the story of Nehemiah the story of Nehemiah this is a story of faithfulness, a story of duty, of commitment and courage. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. You'll remember that the Israelites had been carried captive to Babylon. And for many years, they were there in Babylon, away from their homeland. And Nehemiah was there serving the king. And one day, he heard a report that he heard a report about the status of the walls of Jerusalem. This is what it says here in Nehemiah chapter 1. The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So Nehemiah is in this situation, he, he hears these things and he's, he's very discouraged about what they have said about Jerusalem, his, his, his city, his beloved city. And so he prays and he seeks God. Ellen White says in Prophets and Kings, page 631, in every circumstance, in every circumstance, under every condition, the soul weighed down with grief and care or fiercely assailed by temptation may find assurance Support and succor in the unfailing love and power of a covenant-keeping God. Amen? So, Nehemiah has the courage. He prays and he goes and he asks the king for permission to go back and rebuild his city. And so there he says in verse, chapter 2, verse 5, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you may send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Now, this was a, a dangerous request because the king, he was worried that maybe the king would suspect that he wanted to go back and, and fortify the city or some, he was up to something. But he went forward courageously after he prayed and he asked the king this question. And to his surprise, the king is favorable. Not only is he favorable, but then he he is able, because he sees that the king has granted his request, he asks him for safe passage. And so the king grants him royal letters to secure his safe travel. And so he makes his plans to go back to Jerusalem. And by the way, Nehemiah was not sloppy in his planning. He planned carefully and diligently. Ellen White says, speaking of this in Prophets and Kings, that he did not regard his duty done when he had wept and prayed before the Lord. He united his petitions with holy endeavor, putting forth earnest, prayerful efforts for the success of the enterprise in which he was engaged. Careful consideration and well-matured plans are as essential, here it is, are as essential to the carrying forward of sacred enterprises today as in the time of the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls. Amen? He was faithful in his planning. It, you know, it, it, just drawing the parallel again, it reminds me of the things we were hearing about Queen Elizabeth. Faithfulness to duty, faithfulness to the job that we've been given. That was Nehemiah in his work. So Nehemiah, he, he, he organizes his team. He goes back to Jerusalem, goes through, you know, the, the provinces. He gets safe passage back to Jerusalem, and he arrives there. 
But when he arrives, his presence doesn't go unnoticed because some of the heathen kings around get a little bit suspicious of this man who has come with this retinue of soldiers. They're, they're a little jealous, and they wonder what he could be doing, and so critically, they're watching him. Well, three days after he arrived, he goes out by night in the cover of darkness, and he looks at the condition of the walls. He's got to find out how bad are these walls. And so he takes a couple of men with him, and he goes and he surveys the walls. And as he does that, his heart is deeply moved as he sees the broken down condition of God's holy city. The next day, he calls the people together. He, he, he has a commission from the king to rebuild, so he could command them, but he doesn't want to just command them. As a real leader, he wants to inspire them. He wants to move their hearts. He wants to win their hearts. And so he shares with them the providences of God. He shares with them how God had answered his prayer before the king. And as he shares, the people see that God was the one that made this happen. And their hearts are moved as he shares. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18 says, I told them of the hand of my God which had been good upon me and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us what? Rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. My friends, will we set our hands to the good work that God has given us to do? Amen? Do you think that you and I have a good work to do? Do you know that Ellen White tells us that the heaven-appointed task of taking the gospel to the world, no more important task has given to, been given to mortal man? I would even submit to you that it is even more important than the work that Queen Elizabeth herself was doing. Do you follow me? Now, the work she was doing was very important. My brother, here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Working for the United Nations. As a diplomat, you do very important work for the country of Zimbabwe. But even though your work is very important for your nation, the most important work you do, the most important work any of us do is to be a representative of the King of Kings, right? So we must set our hands to the good work that God has put before us, the good work of taking the gospel to the world. Ellen White says in Prophets and Kings, this appeal went straight to their hearts. The thought of how heaven's favor had been manifested toward them put their fears to shame. And with new courage, they said with one voice, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Nehemiah's whole soul was in the enterprise he had undertaken. His hope, his energy, his enthusiasm, his determination were contagious. Inspiring others with the same high courage and lofty purpose, each man became a Nehemiah in his turn and helped to make stronger the heart and hand of his neighbor. Amen. How many of you have seen someone who's contagious in their enthusiasm? Amen. And it inspires you to also be courageous. I would even say, I don't know if we call Queen Elizabeth enthusiastic, <laughs> But she was very determined, wasn't she? She was resolute. And her courage and calm demeanor, I think, inspired the nation to go through some of those hard times. Friends, you and I influence other people. As we have courage and commitment to the Lord, it inspires those around us. Everybody is a leader, really. So I tell our church, I challenge you to have that kind of courage, that kind of commitment to the cause of God. All right. So, the amazing thing is, and I'm going to fly now through this, but you know what happened? Every family took a part of the wall. Amen? Some families took the wall that was right in front of their house. They had real motivation to build that part of the wall. And even mentions that in some cases, where there were no sons, one of the daughters helped build the wall. The point is that everyone was involved in the effort. I would call this total member involvement in the Old Testament. <laughs> Here's a verse talking about this, Nehemiah 3, 1 and 2. Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and built the sheep gate, and they consecrated it and hung its doors. They built it as far as the Tower of the Hundred and consecrated it, and then as far as the Tower of Hananel, next to Eliashib, the men of Jericho built, and next to them, Zachar, the son of Emery built. And if you read through chapter 3, Family after family after family builds the wall all the way the three miles around that city. Amazing. All of them working together. That's how they did it, friends. 
You see, as the church of God, every one of us has a part to play, right? Every family, you have a part to play. Here in Waitara Church, everyone has a different role, but everyone is important, every role is important, and that includes you kids too, amen. What do you say? Yes. <laughs> They're looking like me? Yes, you, right here. You are singing, praising God up here this morning. That's part of doing God's work. Every one of us has a role that God is calling us to fulfill faithfully in his kingdom. I love how it says in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6, the people had a what? Mind to work. In other words, they were not slothful in their duty. They were courageous. They were diligent. And they were faithful to the task that God had given them. Again, reminds me of the queen and her faithfulness to her duty. May we be faithful to the duties that God has given to us. Here's what Ellen White says, talking about Nehemiah's leadership. He, she says, with tireless vigilance, he superintended the building, directing the workmen, noting the hindrances and providing for emergencies. Along the whole extent of that three miles of wall, his influence was constantly felt. With timely words, he encouraged the fearful, aroused the laggard, and approved the diligent. And ever he watched the movements of their enemies who attempted to divert their attention. In many activities, Nehemiah did not forget the source of his strength. And this is important, friends. I want you to notice this. His heart was what? Constantly uplifted to God. The great overseer of all. The God of heaven, he exclaimed. The God of heaven will prosper us. And the words echoed and re-echoed, thrilling the hearts of the workers of the wall. Friends, the God of heaven is in charge of this work, and he will see it through. Amen. Never be discouraged about God's work. Sometimes things in the church get discouraging. Sometimes people get discouraging. Sometimes you get, ah, oh, Lord, I'm not sure how this is going to work out. Friends, this is God's work. Amen. We can be faithful to him. He is going to be faithful. He is going to see it through. Let us be courageous like Nehemiah was courageous. The words reminded me again of that statement of the queen that we read a few minutes ago. <laughs> I declare my whole life shall be devoted to your service. Will we declare our whole lives to be devoted to the service of God and his kingdom, fully committed to his work? Just like those guards who guard the queen, will we stay completely focused on the mission of taking the three angels' messages to the world in this generation? Or will we let the people that are trying to distract us pull us off our mission? We need to be focused, friends, and committed. Now, when we do God's work, what happens? What often happens? I'll just put it that way. Opposition arises. You guys know that all too well. People come and they try to pull us off our mission. And sure enough, that happened with Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 4, starting with verse 1. So it happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. He was trying to, 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 to distract them from their mission. What kind of distractions do we have today, friends? I won't go through them, but just think in your mind, what kind of distractions are out there that pull us off the mission that God wants you to fulfill? There's probably many distractions that you could think of that are in your life. God wants us to focus our eyes on Jesus at the task he's given us and not be distracted by the things the enemy is throwing at us. And you know, sometimes those distractions and those discouragements come from within the church. It's quiet. <laughs> It's true, it is. Sometimes it happens from within the church. In Nehemiah, verse 10 of chapter 4, notes that some of the men who were <laughs> discouraging him were actually of the tribe of Judah. The strength of the laborers, they said, is, is failing. There is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. Nehemiah, how are you going to finish this? There's just no way you're going to be able to do this job. Friends, Sometimes discouragements come when we don't have faith. But Nehemiah doesn't look at the people that are talking discouragement. He doesn't look at the enemies that are out there trying to, to, to pull them off their purpose. He focuses on the purpose. 
But taunts and ridicule, Ellen White says, opposition and threats seemed only to inspire Nehemiah with firmer determination and to arouse him to greater watchfulness. He recognizes the dangers that must be met in this warfare with their enemies, but his courage was undaunted. His courage was undaunted. Friends, will our courage be undaunted in the face no matter what the enemy tries to throw at us? And so by God's grace, he keeps building. They keep building, working quickly and efficiently. And it says here in chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, he positions men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings. And I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. In salvation history, at key moments, these words, do not be afraid, often come. Remember what Moses said to the children of Israel when they were standing at the banks of the Red Sea in the Exodus? He said what? Do not be afraid. Remember what Joshua and Caleb said to the children of Israel as they, were, as they had surveyed the land of Canaan? What did they say to them? Do not be afraid. Friends, do not be afraid. Jesus is coming soon. We have a task to fulfill. No matter what challenges you're having in your life, no matter what opposition you're facing in your life, do not be afraid. God is able. He is more powerful than your challenges. He is more, 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 he is more than able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or think. Do not be afraid. And so they built, and they built with swords in their hands. I love uh, what it says here in verse 17. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other they held a what? A weapon. Now, friends, I'm not telling you to go and hold a weapon. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. But what weapon do you have at your disposal? The Word of God. With one hand, you need to be working in God's kingdom. With the other hand, you need to be armed with the word of God. And when you have the word of God at your side, no matter what the devil throws at you, you will be successful because this is his word. So to me, this is a reminder that we need to have the word of God. Remember what 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. God is able. Some of you may have seen that movie, The War Room. You ever seen that movie? Yeah. Where the woman has a, her prayer closet, and in that prayer closet, she prays. And some might say, whoa, what power is there in that, friends? She knew where the true power lie. The power was in prayer. By the way, I just want to say thank you to our prayer ministries team, Fiona and your team. Thank you for praying this past week, every night faithfully for this church and for the mission of the church. Amen. Prayer is the power in our work. And what a blessing that you have a praying church, Pastor Barron. God is good. Keep praying. Put the word of God in your minds and in your hearts. Carry this Bible as you come, wherever you go. God's word needs to be by our side all the time. And so day and night, they were working. They were faithful to their duty. And the Bible says in verses 21 to 23, we labored in the work, and half of the men held their spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. I love the way it says that. All day they labored. At the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem, that they may be our guard by night and working party by day. So neither I, nor my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing. <laughs> now, I, I like that the Bible mentions as an aside that they did wash their clothes. Amen. <laughs> but the point is that they were so focused on the task that the only thing that mattered was doing that task well. They were focused. They were determined. They would not shrink back from hard service. Again, it reminds me as I think about the queen. I think about her dedication to her task, her focused determination to serve her people. And friends, again, our focus and determination, I would submit to you, is an even greater need than that of the queen because we have an even higher calling to take the gospel to the world. 
Nehemiah was faithful to his duty. He made God his strength and went forward until it was done. And friends, by God's grace, Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 16, 15 says, So the wall was finished, amen, on the 25th day of Elu in 52 days. And I love how it says in this next verse, and it happened when all our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things that they were very disheartened in their own eyes for they perceived that this work was done by our God. Friends, one day the world, and it is seeing now, the church is being empowered by the Holy Spirit to take the gospel to the world. And when people see the impact that the church has on the world, the only thing that they will be able to say is that this work was done by God. This is not a work of man. This is a work done by God. I shared with you what happened in the Philippines with Adventist World Radio, right? When I was here in April, I shared with you about the miracle of the rebels that came to Christ. The rebels who, there was no hope for these rebels, humanly speaking. But through the power of the gospel, through the power of Jesus Christ, through the power of the word of God and the Seventh-day Adventist message, thousands of rebels have now given their hearts to Jesus. And we can only say, this work is done by God. This is not a work of man. This is a work of God himself. Friends, when you are working with God, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or imagine. Because it's his power, not yours. When we put our trust in him, he is able to do the impossible. Ellen White says, Prophets and Kings 645, Amidst great discouragement, Nehemiah made God his trust, his sure defense. And he who was the support of his servant has been the dependence of his people in every age. In every crisis, his people may confidently de declare, if God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. However craftily the plots of Satan and his agents may be laid, God can detect them and bring to naught all their counsels. The response of faith today will be the response made by Nehemiah. Our God shall fight for us. For God is in the work, and no man can prevent its ultimate success. God is in the work. No man can prevent its success. The work of God will triumph. The question that is in you and I's hands today is what will our part be? Do you hear me, church? What is our response going to be when God calls you to do your part? How are you going to respond? I love this African proverb here that says, when you pray, what? Move your feet. <laughs> it's not enough just to pray. We need to act on our prayers. Follow in faith to where God is leading and let God provide us the power to accomplish what he has called us to do. I love this statement from Queen Elizabeth. She said this, when life seems hard, the courageous don't lie down and accept defeat. Instead, they are all the more determined to struggle for a better future. Are we all the more determined when life gets hard to keep fighting for the mission of taking the gospel to the world? There is no better future than that, right? And everybody needs a chance to hear. My friends, now, before I close, I have to, I just have to mention, you know, okay, we've talked about Queen Elizabeth, and that's great. We praise God for her life, for all that she stood for, and for her faithful example. Amen. We talked about those guards that, that were single-mindedly focused on, on defending the queen, right? Nothing will distract them from their duty of defending the queen. A good example for us. We talked about Nehemiah and the builders of the wall and how faithful they were to their duty, faithful to the task until that wall was built. Nothing would distract them from their mission. But friends, there is one who is greater than Nehemiah. There is one who is greater than Queen Elizabeth. Amen. There is one who is greater than any man who has ever lived on the face of the earth. And he alone is faithful. He alone is the one who is the true king of kings and the Lord of lords. The king who will reign forever and his kingdom will have no end. He is the one who is ultimately faithful who went to the cross for you and me. Paul reminds us that we must look to him, he who came to fulfill the purpose of the Father. 
Looking unto Jesus, Paul says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, Jesus was the one who was faithful. He is the one who was faithful for you. He went to the cross for you. He gave his life for you. He was faithful unto death for you. And because he was faithful, you too can be faithful. Amen. You can't be faithful of yourself. You don't have it. I'm sorry to say. But because he was faithful, because it is his power, not yours, you too can be faithful to the duty God has given you to fulfill. Isn't that good news today? Isn't that good news? Jesus didn't say anything to those who are ridiculing him. Remember what Isaiah said. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers were silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus went to the cross, not complaining. He went because he loved you. He was faithful to his duty until his work was done. And because he did that, Paul can also say in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised is what? Faithful. faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. The queen's life was all about faithfulness to her duty. In a similar way, all of us need to be faithful to our duty. Ellen White says in Education, page 57, a quote that you know well, the greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. Will you be men and women who will stand for the right, who will do your duty no matter what is happening around you? The passing of the seasons, friends, reminds us that time is short. Here we are in another spring. Jesus is coming soon. Do you hear me, church? Jesus is coming soon. None of us is guaranteed tomorrow, much less next year. But we must do all in our power. We must be awake to the opportunities that God has given us to be faithful on our part of the wall. Why, Tara Church, I ask you today again, where is God calling you to be faithful? I'll make it practical really quick as we close. we got to be sober and vigilant. Remember what 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We must be faithful to our duty. Constantly looking to Jesus. We must be on our guard all the time. We must be present in our minds, not just present in the pews. Amen? We could be here and not here. We need to be fully engaged with Jesus. Friends, if you don't have a devotional life, please start this week. Please start. Take a little bit of time every day to spend time in the Word of God. It is your sword. Don't go out into this world without your sword by your side. Spend time in prayer. Remember what 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. Again, thank you, prayer team, for what you've done this week. But let it not stop here. May this church be a praying church, Amen. praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that God would do what only he can do. Pray together in groups. Pray on your own. Pray that God would work his miracles in your life. Keep the morning watch. Study the word. Study your Sabbath school lesson. Amen. Do your daily devotions. Use the gifts and talents God has given you because no matter how big or small they may seem to be, every person has a place on the wall. The changing of the guard. The queen's changing of the guard has now gone to King Charles. Kings and queens are ordained by God. The times and seasons are in his hand. God ordained it, God foretold it. And just as surely... As the time moves along, God has ordained that you are in the world for such a time as this. He has foreseen your existence and he knows just what talents and gifts you have. He has a calling on your life just as surely as he had a calling on Nehemiah's life. You and I must fulfill the purpose that he has given us to do. God appoints us, but the question is, will we say yes to his appointment?
We must be willing to say yes. Remember, Ellen White was called. Others were called before her, but they said no, but she said yes. I think if you think of the story of David, others could have done that job of killing Goliath, but David was the only one who was courageously willing to say yes, Lord. Friends, you and I are called. We are chosen for such a time as this. We are all sons and daughters of the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are on guard now. It is your time. It is your moment. The question I ask you today is, will you say, yes, Lord, I want to fully commit my life to being on guard. I want to be. I want to be your man, your woman. God, in my life, friends, I just want to share with you, just as I close, that the Lord has led in my life in ways I could have never imagined. I never anticipated that he would lead me to Adventist World Radio to be able to see his miracles around the world. To see what God is doing is incredible. I'm I'm just so humbled to stand before you and be able to share a witness of what God is doing. We need to realize the times in which we're living. We need to realize that each one of us is called. I may be at AWR, but you are here and God has a purpose for your life. Will you devote your whole life to God? Will you give everything that you are to him? You are kings and queens of the Lord Jesus. My friends, the time is now. There is no greater time than now. I want to invite you as we close. I just, I just want to invite you. If, if God is speaking to your heart today, if you realize that you too are called to be a part of this work, <laughs> that you too would say, <laughs> hand me another brick. How's that? Amen. Oh, there it was. It was there. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> hand me another brick, Lord. I'm ready to do my part to help build the kingdom. Amen? Amen. If that's your desire, would you just stand with me right where you are? You can say, Lord Jesus, hand me another brick. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. And I just want to say this as we pray. God may lay on your heart. He may have already laid on your heart something that he's calling you to do for his kingdom. I don't know what it is. I don't know what he's put on your heart. Maybe some of you have a desire to be a missionary, but you've not had the courage to step forward and make that decision. I want to challenge you today. Don't, don't be afraid of making that step of courageous commitment to the Lord Jesus. I'm serious, guys. Don't put off that decision. Maybe for some of you, it's, a, it's, a, it's getting more involved here at the Waitara Church. You want to say, Lord I have talents. I want to put them into your work. And I want to raise my hand and say, Lord, hand me another brick. I want to be more involved in your work here at the church. Is there anybody that wants to say that today? Amen. Amen. God bless you. There may also be someone here today, you have not made a full commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to make a decision to follow him in baptism or rebaptism. I don't know if that's you, but if it is, don't put off that decision anymore. Make that full commitment. God needs you to answer his call today. Is there anyone in that? If you, you want to say, Lord, I, I felt the stirring of the Holy Spirit in my heart, and I want to prepare for baptism or rebaptism, just raise your hand right where you are. Maybe if you're online and you're watching, God sees your heart. If there's anybody here, feel free. If, you're not, if you don't want to raise it today, that's okay but I want you to be encouraged to talk to one of the pastors. Make that decision. Don't put it off because, friends, today is the day of salvation. Amen. Amen? You are on guard now. God is calling you. Will you say yes? Lord, hand me another brick. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this Sabbath day where we have gathered together. Thank you for this Waitara Church family for the commitment, Lord, that have been, the commitments that have been made this morning. And Lord, we thank you for the, the life and the legacy of Queen Elizabeth II. 
We thank you for her faithful devotion to her duty. For the 70 years that she served her nation and her people. And Lord, it reminds us of the importance of faithfulness. It reminds us that we too are called to be faithful to a task that is, yes, even more important than the task of the monarch. That task is taking the gospel to the world. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us not to be slothful in our duty, but diligent, just as Nehemiah was diligent. Help us not to be distracted by the things that seek to distract us, but have a single-minded focus on the mission of taking your gospel to the world. And Lord, I pray for everyone that is standing. Some have stood in commitment, and maybe there's someone here today who has said, yes, Lord, I want to be a missionary in their hearts. Give them courage to follow that call. Lord, some raise their hands for wanting to be more involved here at Waitara. I pray that you would give them encouragement to follow through on that commitment, Lord, that they too would do their part and say, hand me another brick. Father, there may be someone who was wrestling with the question about baptism or rebaptism. Be with that person. Help them to make that commitment, Lord, to follow you all the way forever. Lord, ultimately, all of us stand today because we want to recommit ourselves we want to stand shoulder to shoulder, arm to arm. Just like those Israelites of old stood on the wall, shoulder to shoulder, Lord, we say, use us to build this wall until we see you coming in the clouds of heaven. Take our hearts, take our lives, take our devotion. And Lord, help us to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you, Father, for hearing and answering this prayer. And thank you that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine, according to the power of Jesus that works in us. We thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer and for answering it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.